Thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. This is the July 2018 Q&A. Yes, with all three of us. Yeah, all three of us. <laughs> we get so many questions, quite honestly. A lot of these are running well over an hour that we're mm -hmm. going to split this into two parts. Okay. I think that um, when you look at view time, things that go after about half an hour starts to go... Boo! Although the Q&A content is some of the most popular content on the channel. Yeah. Which is... Uh, I like it. You guys come up with good questions. You do. So why not break it into two and that, therefore you get half an hour of it. But we'll also still do the podcast version as well for the Patreon supporters. So let's All go right. ahead. We'll go ahead and get going. I guess. Fire it up. Yep. So uh, question one, Bobby M. If the 1986 Gun Act were to be repealed, what SMG would you buy new, or what would you build and sell? Uh, I would build myself a Suomi. Really? The parts kits for the Suomi are like 300 bucks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The thing is, now I say that because you and I each have M11A1s. That's true. And lay jumpers. Which are awesome. And that really is... Like if I want a practical submachine gun, that's it. It's amazing Pretty how much. good that it's amazing how good that hack is. It really is. Yeah. yeah. So then the question becomes, okay, what's the submachine gun that I think would be really cool and fun to own, but I'm not willing to go spend twenty thousand dollars on? Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I, I can see other possibilities out there. Uh, a full auto Hotchkiss Universal would be kind of cool. Uh, uh, sure. In fact, that'd be an easy one because I have a semi auto. Yep. The eighty six band goes away. Boom. I'll, uh, I'll pay the 200 bucks to modify that thing. machine gun. Sure. But yeah, so let's say that. A Hotchkiss Universal or a Suomi. Hmm. That's building. Would you buy something new? No. No? I would. I would. I don't know that I would build much. The Suomi is definitely yeah. on the list. Uh, I, would, I would buy a P90. Oh, I didn't think about that as a submachine gun. It is a submachine gun. It's You're a, right. The P90. Yeah. The PS90 yes. in semi-auto is kind of eh, because the round is a little eh, but when you get it in full auto... That thing rocks. It That's is a very good point. It's a fantastic submachine gun. I think it's, I think it's the peak of submachine gun development, actually. Okay. Not so a, not a Chris. No, not a Chris. Okay. No, I'd go. I'd go. I'd get a P90. That would be very tempting. Very compelling, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it would be. So there you go. That's funny. You're talking about old stuff, but the P90 even gets to you. You're like, yeah, yeah. A lot of people out there in the watch that have shot the semi-auto PS90, and that's cool. It's fun. But when you get it, when you get to run that thing, and it's a, and it's proper size, which is small. The thing's this big. It really it's is smaller than that. Yeah, it's tiny, and it's really easy to carry around and and and, and very, fifty round mags and burp, and burp, it's got the perfect burp. rate of fire with minimal recoil. That thing is something. That's, yeah, it doesn't matter when one round isn't all that potent when you've got fifty of them and you can do it in full <laughs> auto, right? So yeah. the P90 would be my answer to that one. Good answer, Joe L. What are the chances of seeing a match where you just equip yourselves as horribly as possible? And no, I don't mean when you use World War One or World War Two gear. I mean like a high point carbine and a Taurus Judge, or something even worse. Because seeing the two of you shooting with gear that's damn near working against you, those are some of the most interesting matches to watch. <laughs> we do hear that a lot. People do like watching these matches in which we're completely getting just destroyed right. by our own gear and equipment. Oh, doggo. Lie down. Yes. Lie so, down. You know, that's an interesting question. Uh, we've talked about the high point card. You know, the high point card is actually not that bad a gun. No, really. it isn't. Yeah. Uh, the problem with a lot of this sort of stuff is capacity. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't want to run a revolver. A judge? It, any revolver, on, almost. Yeah. Um, now, I, I will be running one with a show shot. Well, of course. Sooner or later. You have to be, yeah. yeah. I tell you what, I'd rather have a high point carbine for practical matters. Oh, show shot. Yeah, I think the whole, I think the high point would pretty much run circles around the show shot. If the high, if the French saw the high point carbine, they'd be like, "This is the new wonder weapon. We're going <laughs> to win the war with it." Actually, everybody in World War One would have been wonder weapon. Yeah. So that's funny. When you put it in context, the high point carbine in 1917 would have been awesome. It really would. Have been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, I guess this is an interesting question because it, you, a high point carbine, which isn't really that bad, but let's say, uh, I don't know, some awful. Pistol. Yeah, there's a lot of awful pistols to choose from. Oh. We've kind of done it before. We shot the Nagant revolver, which is a complete that's, turd. That's true. Yeah. Um, there is a, a breaking point at which the gun, you simply can't complete the match. And there's a point where it's just not fun. I get the entertainment in watching it, but I think that <laughs> only goes goes to a certain level. Well, it's more entertaining to the audience than necessarily is us shooting it, but it's definitely more entertaining to you guys than it is to us. The thing about this is, is that just shooting garbage is shooting garbage. When you're shooting something historical that happens to be garbage by modern standards but has history to it, it's still interesting. Yeah. Because you're getting the history, you're getting the historicity out of it, you're getting the historical experience. And so yeah. therefore, while you're completely behind the eight ball with some World War One bolt action rifle, at least you're shooting a World War One bolt action rifle. Yeah. When you bring out that garbage set Saturday night special and it's garbage it's just garbage it has no historicity to yeah. it and so therefore the fun as the competitor is like it diminishes a lot yeah um, you know as we move on hopefully 
before the end of the year, we're going to be trying to do some of that non-permissive environment stuff. Yeah. That's not garbage, but it's behind the curve. It's closer. Yeah. It's closer to garbage. So maybe that'll be somewhere in the middle to scratch that itch, yeah. Joe. Um, Osmi A. Hope you guys finally answer my question. Yes. Here yes, we will. What's your opinion on interrupted cycle semi-auto, also known as lever release guns, like the ones becoming popular in the UK, that could be used to comply with the assault weapon ban legislation? They're all clutches. So what he's talking about, the, that is the first time I have heard interrupted cycle, cycle semi-auto. semi-auto. And then he, AKA lever release guns. I'm not sure what this is really. Tell me. Well, so what you're talking about is taking a semi-auto and removing all of the semi-auto bits and oh. turning it into a manually operated one. Like a pump action AK? Yeah. What they have in England, because they have a lot of restrictions, I mean, like complete restrictions on semi-auto guns, Right. are lever action ARs. Or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, bolt action. So will you just cycle the charging handle for sure? Yeah, and sometimes they'll add a a bolt handle in some designs to make it a little simpler than... You know, it's interesting that there are a lot of these guns on the market. Um, In fact, I recently filmed um, a Vector H5, Mm -hmm. which was... It's a South African Galil converted into pump-action semi... Or pump-action manual. Okay. There are the pump action AKs that came out in the US. Those were for California market at one point. Exactly. They were pump yeah. action AKs, yeah. Um, SIG actually made a pump action version of the 550. I didn't know that. They made 12. It didn't take off. Um, and like they made them in 223 yeah. and 222 for countries like France and Italy, where not only can you not have semi autos, but you couldn't have 223 either. Um, I think, obviously, if that's all you can get, okay. It has basically no advantage over a traditional bolt action rifle well it does right it's got a detachable magazine a high capacity mag high capacity that, magazine that also depends on the country and the uh, yeah, that's true. some do some don't i guess if it does okay yeah um i think the pump action ones are probably a little better than the than the, the bolt handle charging ones but by a little bit they're interesting. I wouldn't want to be stuck on one. I guess it's interesting. I guess my opinion on this is just strictly around if that's all you can get, then that's what you get. Yeah. But if if for some reason you didn't were not restricted to that, then there is absolutely no reason to buy one of those. Don't. Things. Yeah. Yeah. So it's unless gonna... you just like, hey, I've decided I want to collect manually operated conversions of self-loading rifles. Weird anomalous stuff. Yeah. There's I... plenty of people out there collecting weird anomalous stuff. <clears throat> I. Yeah, I, um, it's something that shouldn't have to exist. Yeah, kind of, yeah. but it does. So I guess that's the best answer. Jonathan J. Was there anything specific that made you choose to move to Arizona over other states? Attractions, climate, cost, etc. He asked this because in a previous Q and A, both of us moved from other places to here. Mm-hmm. So we both decided to move to Arizona, and so that question is relevant for both of us. Uh, for me, it was cost and climate. Cost and climate. I bought land out in the middle of nowhere that was ridiculously cheap Mm -hmm. Um, and opportunity like this opportunity came up and I liked everything that was involved in it I didn't I didn't actually like go out and solicit you know hunt for property in 50 states and then make up a spreadsheet of which state is the best no I had the opportunity I liked everything about Arizona and so I took it kind of the same thing for me it was easy I was like when I was looking at this it was like Arizona and New Mexico were kind of the two that really caught my eye New Mexico I feel is I actually feel that New Mexico environmentally or ecologically is, is, is a nicer climate there's yeah. there's more diversity so it's actually the, pretty the cities are a little higher elevation yeah, which is nice kind of a prettier place in general and it's also got a lower population so a lot of the natural resources are more even though Arizona's got tons of open space New Mexico has even got more in a yeah. way um, however when you compare the two um, Arizona has an interesting mix of things that are not perfect but close enough like so if one when i first moved here i was in range was not a thing and mm-hmm. and it's still and i and i and I, and, I, and I still pursue it work um and so i had to be doing i had to be here with an it job and phoenix actually has a fairly significant it sector ones that actually understand that there's something called an iss uh, a ciss a security uh, cert and they actually had jobs for security people and so um, while I didn't want to live in Phoenix and I was commuting an hour a day, well, an hour one way each morning and night to get to that, actually over an hour and a half, the reality was you could live in a rural area, have open space, have reasonably priced land and property, but still have a job that paid reasonably well because Phoenix has a market that could 
and sustain it. Fulfill that. Okay. Um, there might be some of that in New Mexico, maybe in Albuquerque, but nowhere near as good as Phoenix. Phoenix actually has a significant tech sector. So in my answer, it was the open space, the freedom that it provides, legally speaking, in terms of just what you want to do with yourself. Uh, the climate is pretty good for most of the year. The price for stuff is pretty low, and there actually are jobs. I should probably add in that a lot of the states with ser like significant gun control mm -hmm. regulations were states I simply wasn't willing to even consider in the first place. Oh, so fair. Arizona yeah. wasn't a random choice that much. It was, of the states I'm willing to consider, which are basically the western ones and not California, which, which one ended up working out for me. Mm -hmm. Similar. Fudge. F-U-D-J, however you pronounce that. Do you guys have any tips or advice for people just getting into class three items, i.e. suppressors? Anything you know now that you wish you would have known when you started? Thanks. I'm still not, not that much into suppressors. I'm not either. I think, you know, it's weird. I don't, want to, I don't want to deflate a balloon. But the thing about this is, is I actually landed up at one point, I got three, three suppressors, three cans. And then I realized uh, that you put them on, and they're never quite quiet enough to not use ears anyway, which is kind of the appeal, right? They're quiet enough to not use ears if you make yourself deaf, but that's not the goal. So the reality is you still have to put on roughs. Yeah. And so it's while it's nicer to people around you, for you, it kind of didn't help that much. And then you've got this heavy thing on the end of your gun, especially on a rifle, it gets incredibly hot. And so now you've got, <laughs> this, you've got this flaming hot thing on the end of the gun that you have to be very cognizant of as you're moving around, or even putting in your bag when it melts the bag. Yeah. And so while I have three suppressors, the reality is I use them almost never. Don't you have two now? We have one blew up. Yeah. <laughs> My red jacket when it died, exploded, literally it just split in half and fell off the gun. But the two that I have, I, I just never use them. I yeah. never freaking use them. They just sit there. And now you've got tax stamp stuff that you have to deal with. Yeah, that's true. And now you've got to tax state stamp. lines. And... But, but it's like, um, so I guess what would be the first thing I would say is like, if you're specifically looking to suppressors, I would ask you, why are you, not, I'm not trying to sabotage the suppressor market. There are obviously reasons to have a suppressor. If you were going to have a suppressor on your home defense pistol or rifle, there's a lot of tactical, practical reasons for a suppressor. Mm -hmm. But for having them for fun, in air quotes, they're just not that fun. So if your goal is to have them for fun, I would say eh, you might want to reconsider that actually. Yeah, come up with a good rationale why you want one. Yeah. Because it's going to be what, a thousand bucks? Short, unless you're getting something like a really simple 22 can. Yep. You're basically looking at thousand dollars and that's a lot of money for, do you know why you really want it? Like mm -hmm. what's it actually going to do for you? Um, when it comes to machine guns, I would say kind of the same thing. like understand have be able to explain to someone why you want whatever machine gun it is that you're looking at because i think there can be a real temptation to go oh i've got like ten thousand dollars in my gun fund and i can do something with it i can buy a machine gun and you're getting into this because it's a machine gun and that's got this cachet and it's cool but if you end up with an ac556 and then you realize like what can I do with this? Mm -hmm. Or like a buddy of mine who has an underfolding full auto AK mm -hmm. and has kicked himself to this day because it's a craptastic gun. Because if he had a fixed stock one, he could swap a long barrel onto it and a bipod and have a really cool RPK clone in full auto. Sure. Which would be awesome. But instead, if you want to get rid of an underfolding stock, you've got to start hacking on the receiver yeah. and drilling out rivets. And he doesn't want to do that to a registered transferable gun. Of course not. So, and a historical gun too with that. Um, so it's like, un figure out like, why do you want this gun? For example, your M11A1, Yes. there's a really good reason to have that as long as you're interested in a submachine gun. It's like, get that, get the Lage, and then presto, you've got something that's really as good as any modern submachine gun. Arguably so, I think, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot different from, oh, I'm going to go buy an Uzi. Well, is an Uzi really what you want? Does an Uzi, is it going to be fun to shoot an Uzi after the first two times you go out to the range? And that may depend on you, right? Maybe yeah, you're a big Uzi oh, fan. Absolutely. Uzi's the gun for you. But yeah. Absolutely. But yeah. if you want to go compete in submachine gun matches, it's not that great. Well, you're gonna want optics, probably. You're gonna want something that's got a better stock on it. Maybe you don't like maybe it turns out you don't like the whole grip to you know magazine and the pistol grip thing. So especially if you like a 45 caliber Uzi. Oh, like, you know. Yeah, no, I guess that's a good point. So suppressors, I would say, unless you have a practical or tactical reason for one. Consider why you're getting yeah. it. These are expensive things, and it's easy to get to fall into the allure of the the cachet of you know, ah, I'm a machine gun owner. 
And then you realize, oh, I just spent $10,000 so that I can be snobby. And, <laughs> and oh, crap, I could have spent that on so many other things that yep. I would actually like to have more. I just, I mean, like, I got my suppressors. I really, I admit this. I got the suppressors because, ooh, cool, I'll get a suppressor. Because suppressors are, like, class three items. But cheap. And well, reasonably so, well, compared to a machine gun. Like, yes, very yeah. cheap. And then once have like I said, after having them for a while, I just stop using them. Yeah. They're just a pain in the ass. Yeah. Well, they are. Big heavy thing hanging out on the gun that gets hot. Yeah. And if you're going to go for machine guns, now you're putting down big bucks. Make sure it's what you freaking want. Like, make absolutely sure. Because once you have it, it's a lot of work to get it, a lot of money to get it. And then if you decide this isn't the thing I wanted, it's a lot of work to get rid of it. When I sold my Vickers gun, it took me about a year. Yeah. Because I spent a while trying to sell it on my own. And then I decided to sell it through an auction. Then, of course, I had to transfer it to the auction house, and that yep. was like a eight-month process. Yep. And then you pack it up and ship it out, and then you wait until the auction actually happens, and then you wait like 45 days after the auction, and then you get paid. So it's, yeah. Fair enough. This one sounds like it's just for you, Ian. Martin S. Ian, have you figured out what you're going to do to get your show shot running? Yeah. Uh, so I have two. I have an 8mm and I have a 30 out 6. The 8mm is still transferring. It is a registered DWAT, but I have a complete spare bolt and barrel assembly for it, so I will be dropping that in and it should basically just be good to go. Uh, the 30 out 6 one requires magazines. I have two original mags that will run with 10 rounds, which is okay, but um, I am getting magazines converted. I'm getting Johnson Light Machine Gun mags converted. That is a single stack 30 out 6 mag that will fit almost, in the mag well, um, and I'm hoping that if I can get like five of those, then I've got 100, 120 rounds of ammo loaded in magazines at any given time, and, and those mags will run just fine forever. Yeah, with the current, your, with your 30 out 6, those 10 round mags, it, it, it just worked. You didn't yeah. have to do anything to make it run. I was expecting to have problems with it, and I haven't. Just That's worked. Good. Yeah, I've got a video coming up. By the time this posts, it'll probably actually okay. be available of me dumping, I think, 120 rounds through that gun as fast as I can reload the mags. Yeah, that's different than having 120 rounds of mags just sitting next to you. True. There's some delay between that, True. right? True, but I didn't think I'd be able to get that. Yeah. So. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. So so there you go. It, you didn't, for the 30 out 6, you didn't have to do anything. No. Nope. Besides, you got to get mags. And with the 8mm, you're going to have to undo wad it. Yeah. Which is a barrel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a, well, bolt and barrel. Bolt and both the the chambers welded up in that thing and it looks like someone took a stick welder mm -hmm. and just went Bleh, in the bolt face which is unfortunately pretty common okay michael b carl do you have any advice for someone looking to get into marksmanship centric competition like high power hey that one sounds like it's just for you yeah it does i haven't shot high power in a long time but um yeah i do um don't don't go don't go crazy and spend a lot of money right off the bat. That's that's step one. A um, couple things you can do in terms of marksmanship centric types of skill sets. You can get into small bore, which is the most OCD of all OCD things, but it really really is a marksmanship centric thing that will get you incredible skills. Um, if you don't want to deal with 22 LR, then I would recommend looking at the um, the uh, military rifle matches that they have that are essentially high power light. They're fired only at 200 yards. You can bring any kind of rifle out there. You can bring ARs out there. You can shoot on the standard SR1 target, which is where you should start before you start getting to the harder targets, or you can shoot reduced. So you, those are all at 200 yards. But shooting at 200 yards, even on a reduced target, is still easier than shooting at 600 yards on a non-reduced target. Doggo. She's, she's, really, uh, yeah, she's really into this. Persuasive here. Lie down. So what I would say is those military rifle matches that are only at 200 yards, but allow you to use anything. You can use an M1. You can use a bolt-action rifle. They still have the quintessential elements of high power, but they are a little bit less uh, difficult to get into. And you can start with very simplistic stuff like just a regular BDU. So you know, but you, you don't have to get everything immediately. Okay. That's what I would say. So I don't know if that helps exactly, but you could look at um, small bore, or I would say looking at the vintage rifle matches. That's the word I'm looking for. I'm saying military. They call them vintage rifle. But almost every place that runs a vintage rifle match will allow you to shoot an AR there, either on a reduced target or on standard targets, and that's a great place to get started. Nice. Yeah. All right. Matthew J. Not exactly a question. But I'd like to see a serious two-gun match pushing the defensive slash trench assault capabilities of the scatter gat, scatter gun, with a shotgun, with stage scoring that doesn't depend entirely on speed of jamming shells in it. Could that be done? Yes, we have video of it being done. Well, we didn't use a World War One gun, but we have video of us shooting a, a shotgun match with rules 
Yeah, I used it. Single, single, single shot. shot. <laughs> so yes, there is there are some there's some legacy content on the channel, and the two gun action challenge match venue does have a scoring rule set for shotguns, and it's actually really cool. It fixes the problem. Yeah. Um, because it allows you to use slugs, which give I think if I recall correctly, was, I'm sorry, that was four. What? Four hits for a slug. Yeah, it is. It's okay. three or four. The point is slugs. There was different. There was different. You had to have so many hits on target to neutralize the target, right. and so this one slug would count for enough. Yeah. Then the buckshot was you had to get at least enough of those pellets on the target, and it was a real interesting game about people who had their guns really regulated or not, whether or not they thought they would get enough pellets on the target at the distance we were shooting at them. I had to get enough to have a neutralization. Right. I remember that one match we had paper targets at 40 yards. Yes. And the question is, do you know your sights well enough to hit a slug at, on a silhouette at 40 yards? Or do you know your choke well enough to be confident that you can get two or three buckshot pellets in A or B zones at 40 yards? The part that really mitigates a lot of this shoving jam, jamming shells into it, which is really the match that three guns turned into with shotguns, is mm -hmm. that the way we do this is besides the scoring mechanism that still uses slugs, buckshot, not really birdshot, and three guns almost all birdshot now, which is another thing that's a problem with. But um, that's one thing. But the other thing that really is a big difference is that you start with the shotgun fully loaded, mm -hmm. And when the shotgun ran empty, you could continue to reload it throughout the course of fire if you wanted to jam shells in it. But if the shotgun runs empty, you could then decide, do I reload the shotgun or switch to my sidearm? Right. That changes everything because suddenly now the pistol becomes your primary and your shotgun just becomes something you retain. And that speed reloading stuff that you see in three gun on the shotgun is just completely gone. Right. Now, if you can consistently keep the gun stoked as you're moving through the course of fire, that's perfectly fine. And it's a lot easier to make hits with a shotgun than a pistol. So that's one of those things you got to decide what you want to do. But with the scoring me mechanism and the rules being that the gun starts fully loaded and you cannot transition to your pistol until it is A, completely empty, or B, malfunctions so severely that it's no longer functional. Because you would not transition from your long arm to your pistol arbitrarily in real life. That would be a stupid decision. So the rules force that. By making rules like that, you can make a match that gets rid of the three-gun gamer part of shotgun and still have shotguns in it. Yeah. It, yeah. And it means you don't you you no longer have to have a shotgun based on its capacity. You don't need a no. 24 inch barrel with a mag tube that's five inches longer sticking out the bottom. Correct. You could run it with a five round pump gun, kind of a standard. I guess a lot of them are eight. Yeah. Five to eight rounds, whatever. You don't have to go buy a special shotgun. You can use any pretty much ordinary shotgun. Yep, yep. And you can even have it's really an interesting mechanism. And I wish that those rules were more prolific. And someday, yeah. someday, we'll run another shotgun match. <laughs> the funny thing is, is we don't want to run the shotgun match on a regular two-gun match day because it'll confuse people. We don't have a good communication system for no. match attendees. Everyone's so used to just showing up third Saturday with a rifle and a pistol that if we do a shotgun match, a third of the people are not going to find out about it, and they're going to show up with a rifle, and they'll be sad, and it'll be chaotic. So the only way we can do a shotgun match is if we take some extra day. So we have to take like a, like a fifth Saturday or something like that and dedicate it. And historically speaking, um, every time we've done that, the attendance has been very low. And it's a lot of work. The shotgun matches are way more work than the rifle matches because there's a lot of paper, a lot of stuff you got to consider. And so we'll do it again someday, but the reality is it's a difficult endeavor and we have to do it on a separate day, which means running two matches in a month, which is a lot of work as well. But yes, it is possible to do. Uh, this is a completely gibberish name, which is completely unintelligible because it was characters that do not translate when you print. ASCII string 87. It is I umlaut A apostrophe Y thing U umlaut G A B one half five at T. So it's, yeah. a, it's a Russian hacker. But you, right, and Russian what hacker. They what kind of footwear do you folks use during matches? I see people using everything from hiking boots to trail runners, and I'm wondering what mm -hmm. you find is most comfortable for a full day of shooting. I'm not worried about comfort. You're not? No, the ground out here is angry and dangerous. It's true. I wear Danner boots. Yeah, me too. I tend to stick with Danner boots. Uh, I like Danners. Danners are something I just kind of, I guess I'm a little bit brand loyal on Danners. Um, however, I do recommend better than average combat boots. Um, yeah. We've seen people using hiking hiking boots or running boots. We've seen people using Nikes for that matter. In fact, I use what I use Reeboks for the uh, you use Adidas Adidas for the, excuse me Adidas for the Red October because Russian right, but the reality is that wasn't a good idea and there were moments where my ankles didn't have the support they should have and I did slip in gravel, so what you want is good tread, uh, good ankle protection and I think that's about it and that really is defined by a lot of high end combat boots combat boots again um, achieve those goals. I'm honestly looking for something to protect my feet from stepping on choya buds mm. and cactuses. 
and that to me is more important than anything else. Fair. So these these danners are comfortable. They protect my feet, and they just work. And I don't bother thinking about it beyond that. So in summary, you see everything across the board. It, it, obviously, don't wear flip flops or open toed shoes. That's that's absurd. Yeah. Um, you can get away with simple sneakers. My recommendation is better than average combat boots. Pog Life two one seven one. Hey guys, love the channel even when I don't agree with some of the opinions you have and your attitudes have always come back for more. Cool. Okay, that's good. It's not, you don't have to agree. It's, that's, no. that's part of the discussion. Um, you are, let's, here's the question. You are part of a modern infantry unit with M4s and, a, and M240B light machine guns. You are teleported back to Ostfront 1944. You run into a German unit with STG-44s and MG-42s. Who has the advantage? We do. The M4s and the 240s. Yep, definitely. Definitely. Uh, the M4 is for a number of reasons. One, uh, one is capacity, really, because the, the STG-44 magazines were never filled to full capacity. It's about 25 rounds. Correct. Well, also capacity. Uh, recoil. Yep. The M4 has minimal recoil compared to an STG. The flatter shooting cartridge with higher velocity means it's easier to score hits at moving targets that are going across your field of view for a short duration of time. Yep. And uh, frankly, more reliable. And more accurate, too. <laughs> Far more accurate, yeah. SCG 44s are like four minute, five minute They're guns. They're not accurate guns. Five minute guns, maybe? If, if you're a gunsmith and you want to see something both terrifying and interesting, start doing headspace checks on MP 44s. Yeah, they, they just don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> They're huge. So this, if you look at um, anyone shooting high speed, and I'm sure you can find some of this even on in range or forgotten weapons for that matter, high speed footage of, or even not even regular footage of people shooting SCG 44s. There's occasionally gigantic fireballs coming out of the ejection port. Yeah. And the reason, and you see that on every gun once in a while, but SCG 44s do it all the time. And the reason for that is the headspace is so bad that the, it's opening up and not even completely sealed and it's ejecting some of that flaming gas out the side of the ejection port. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the strength of the cartridge case that prevents that from being a catastrophic problem. Fair enough. And the SCG 44 in its day was a revolutionary weapon that essentially defined the modern assault rifle concept. But the M4 has been become the epitome of what the assault rifle can and should be. You know, as good as the STG-44 was, yeah. uh, a quote I heard actually from Tony Neofito hmm? said, the first of everything is crap. I think he said, he said shite. Yeah, okay. The first version of anything is shite. Okay. And the MP44, compared to today's military assault rifles, is shite. Fair. It's a great gun for its day. Yeah. But the M4 is in every conceivable way better. Oh, I agree. It, not, and ergonomics come into that. The, the safety location, the accuracy, the recoil, the cartridge, all of that matters. And the, I think the difference between the 240 and the 42 mm -hmm. is a lot less substantial, mm -hmm. but I'd still probably go with the 240. Oh, I'd agree with that. Uh, first of all, the rate of fire is not insane. That's, that would be my... Insane concern. rate of fire. MG42 was completely held back by its insane, unrealistic, impractical rate of fire. Yeah. I don't um, want to carry that much ammo. No, no, you can't. You can't keep the thing resupplied. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So scary to hear, but not really necessarily going to score more hits, right? Um, so I would have to say the M240, uh, the, excuse me, the M4s and the 240B would uh, cut a swath through ding, that. Ding. And one more thing about the cartridge. Shooting 8mm courts at 300 meters is way harder to score a hit than 5.56. Yeah. 5.56 is flat shooting at even at 300, and you pretty much hold on target and hit it. And you don't do that with 8mm courts. Jonathan S. Min Range and Forgotten Weapons has seemed to have a growing relationship with Varus Galeka. You th are you thinking this may evolve into a much bigger, mutually beneficial thing like Patreon supports, like getting discount codes, monthly giveaways, etc.? That'd be cool. Well, it's kind of funny that it comes up because when we first started having a relationship with Varus Galeka, mm -hmm. they actually gave us cards to give away. Yeah. So we've done that before, actually. We haven't been doing it recently, but we did do that over a year ago. Yeah, we should do more of that. I think we should. Um, we're going to be going back out there, it, gosh, in, a, in like either 12 hours or a week or something. A week and a half <laughs> uh, for the opening of their new store. We're going to be running a Finnish Brutality 2-Gun match there. We're going to be doing interviews with some really interesting people. Yeah. And we've mentioned maybe doing some more stuff for Patreon supporters and giveaways like Varus Delica cards, and they said they were, they were up for it. Yeah. So yes, I think we are going to see more of that. It's a little bit tricky to maintain an, a really active relationship with them simply because of the geographical distances. True. Um, and the international borders. So there's a lot we can do, but it'd be a lot easier if they were like next door down the street. But I do think that like discount codes or cards are something possible. Obviously it's up to them. That's, yeah, that's their money, really. Um, but yeah, that'd be great. Leo G. Ian, as a fellow Southpaw, did you ever consider a left-handed upper for the What Would Stoner Do project? Nope. No. Why not? I don't need it. 
parts incompatibilities with regular ARs, that's definitely an issue. And then I, there's really no benefit. Um, there are some, some early ARs, ARs that don't have a brass deflector are potentially a problem. Um, I have one of the Troy Repro AR carbines and that thing will hit me in the face with brass. And uh, the little bit of shooting I've done with an original AR-10, that thing hits me in the face with brass. Uh, but as long as you've got a deflector on there, it's not an issue. And the downside of being the only guy for a 50 mile radius with a left handed bolt and receiver outweighs what isn't really a benefit anyway. Once you added the brass deflector, the reality was it was an ambi, the upper is an ambi gun. Yeah. Where, the, where the ambidextrous left handed stuff needs to be considered is in the ergonomics of the lower, the safety, the magazine yeah. release, the charging handle. But, yeah. uh, well, the charging handle being part of the upper, but not. We're, we're, Irregardless of it being left-handed or right-handed upper, right? So when you flip everything to be left-handed ejection, it adds a bunch of weirdo parts that just don't need to be there, and you then pull yourself out of the market of quality parts that are that are across the swath. And with the brass deflector, you're not going to have brass anyway. So yeah. why? Yeah. Never quite understood it. Yeah, we did it. Uh, also, by the way, people, have, a number of people have sent me this. There is apparently James River is making a left-handed M14. Why? Which is actually a right-handed M14. Yeah, the M14 is M14's left-handed to begin with. Um, I have to expect that that is simply because it's there. Like, we discovered we could do it, and we ignored Ian Malcolm's advice, and we just did it. Mm. <laughs> I, I don't know. Good luck to them. I have less than no interest in buying one of those things. The M14, you referred to as a left-handed gun, and in practical use, the charging handle and, and setup is designed yeah. for that. The safety and the mag release are completely ambidextrous to begin with, and the bolt handles on the right side. Now, are however, left. if you were to think about why it was designed that way, which was shooting from match conditions with a sling on your left arm, it's a right-handed gun. Sure. If you were shooting left-handed in high power, you would find it to be more difficult to gun. Yes, that is true. Which is funny because also Americans because are also because it's an M14. All American, well, right. But all American guns are target rifles, right? Even military rifles. You look up at the, the 1903 Springfield, yeah, the M1. The yep. AR, the, a, the, a, the M16A2 is a target rifle. It was yep. modified to be a target rifle, right? Um, so with that in context, in, in those match conditions that it were designed to, ex, to excel in, it was right-handed again. That's true. But in practical... Here, yeah, at that handle uh -huh. on the charging handle. But in practical application, it becomes a left-handed gun. Yeah. Sometimes some of these priorities are a little out of whack. Rise. Carl, before what would Stoner do was completed, you stated a lone individual with a SHT fee excuse me, SHTF World should go with 308. Do you still think that is, do you still think that with the success of the What Would Stoner Do project? Well, I, I do, and the reason I said that, there was a reason for that. I am not a big proponent of full power cartridges like 308, AMO, Browser yeah. for the average individual. However, this was when some of the stuff that was going on in the world was, the, the, there was a lot of those truck attacks, where there were the trucks driving through people. Yeah, the chances of this happening near you is, of course, lightning strike or less reality. Mm -hmm. However, if one were to consider that type of a scenario and wanted a rifle for such a scenario or scenarios like that, or where you're an individual in which you do not have backup or support, another example of this would be out in the wilds of the Arizona desert or the, the forest. You don't have someone to help you, and 5.56, while it is an excellent cartridge, does not lend itself to barrier penetration. And that's where having 308 or a full-size cartridge for an individual who has no backup and nothing else besides him and this rifle tends to start skewing that conversation because okay. if something is behind something, you can shoot through it. If it's a vehicle, you can do something to it. You can do that with 5.56, but much less effectively. So that's where I come to from that. And so does that modify my opinion of the What Would Stoner Do project? No, the What Would Stoner Do project was our attempt to take the AR-15 to another modern step forward, which was still based on the cartridge that it was ultimately designed around because that cartridge has lots of merit. But in terms of an individual in an SHTF world scenario, I would still think you might want to consider something a little more oomph. What do you think? Eh, I'm not going to disagree with anything you just said. You could argue with your point, but I guess. I'm also not particularly worried about trying to get like the most perfect chip at the fan rifle, because mm -hmm. it's never going to actually happen anyway. So Fair. But, you know, hypothetically it's speaking. It's a fun mental exercise, but it's not something I'm going to try and devote a lot of, like, I'm not, I'm not going to stay up at like late at night worrying about should I have a 308 in my trunk or should I have a 556 in my trunk. Fair, fair. But hypothetically speaking, an individual with no backup having a full power cartridge has some merit. Yeah. 
It's not a bad idea. That was the idea. I wouldn't try and come up with the arguments are like, is it 2% better than 556 or vice versa? Okay. Well, there you go. There's the logic behind it, at least. Jacob F., would you consider a video series on finding the most practical band state rifle? Yes. What a fascinating question. <laughs> We've actually said we are doing that. That's one of our projects. It's been taking a while to get off the ground. Yes. We've got most of the stuff yep. ready for it. We just need to actually... We have time, we have to allocate to it, or currently we're still in the midst of the lever gun project. Yeah. So once the lever gun project is done, the next one on the list is making the most practical band state rifle yep. and testing it on the clock. Yep. So we haven't just considered it, we're actively working on it. Yes. Imran, if the constant recoil system generates less felt recoil than traditional systems, why has it not been used in more firearm designs? Well, there hasn't been a lot of development necessarily in machine guns. Mm -hmm. Certainly not in machine guns where controllable full auto fire from the shoulder is particularly important. Mm -hmm. um, I think it maybe it's just a, a system that hasn't gotten a lot of um, a lot of exposure. I don't know. It's a good question. You'd think it ought to. It definitely it's a, works. It is a real thing. You it's, and I have fired guns that use it, and it's incredible. Yeah. Everyone who's ever shot an Ultimax raves about how fantastic they are to shoot. So why haven't more? I'm not sure. I guess we don't have a good answer for that yeah, one. I don't. All right, sorry. Patrick W. How would small arms technology have developed if smokeless powder had not been invented until the early to mid-1900s? Would countries still have moved to smaller caliber rifle, like smaller caliber firearms, or would it have just plateaued with mid-slash-large bore rifles? I think all the developments would have stayed exactly the same and just been shifted uh, later in time to coincide with the development of smokeless powder. Right, but before the smokeless powder, I guess the question is what would have happened? Would there, would there have been changes with black powder, for example, that would have changed? Would, would you have seen mm -hmm. smaller calibers? No. I don't think so, and the reason is the way black powder works. Right, you would not have seen smaller calibers. No. You might have seen more development of some other aspects. Um, you're probably still going to always be looking at rear locking lugs because mm -hmm. those are they're, they're, one of their big benefits is uh, you don't get black powder fouling in your locking lugs if they're on the back of the bolt. Fair. Uh, that's why you see people going to front locking lugs after smokeless powder. Yep. Um, you might see more development of magazine systems, mm -hmm. uh, although you know there were box magazines for black powder. Um, the, there were forty. Yeah, the Remington Lees. You got 4570 box mags. You've got uh, all those, you know, 43 Mauser, 43 Spanish. Um, but box mags are hard with those bit, with 11 millimeter cartridges. Big ass rim things. They've got big rims and they're big cartridges too. Although black powder, stacking those things is black powder does not require rims. That's just true. I mean, true. that's a difference. But and yeah. who knows? Maybe well. But the thing is, the rims work really well in tubular magazines. Fair. And if tubular magazines work really well with the cartridge and the rim works well with the magazine. I think there's a good argument to be made that that kind of would have remained the best system until you get smokeless. And when you get smokeless, you get smaller diameter cartridges. Smaller diameter cartridges are better for box magazines. Box magazines are better with rimless. Mm. And I think all of these things are kind of tied together. I, feel like I do think, obviously, you could still have a rimless black powder cartridge and it could still sure. have a box magazine. You could. The thing is, black powder requires volume. Right. And barrel length for burn time to get to get, get any form of velocity out of it, and you have kind of a limit to how fast you can push anything with black powder. Mm -hmm. And for a military force that's looking for a lot of of energy in a bullet, that means they're going to be going to large diameter bullets too, which is what they did. Right. That's yeah. why you have everything's forty five caliber more or less. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it would. I think you're right. It wouldn't have changed. It just would have delayed. Yeah. But I think they would have stuck with what they stuck with. You would have seen 4570s, et cetera. You might have seen some interesting, really good tube magazine systems. Yeah. Or, give, or helical. Maybe, yeah. Give people another 20 years to tinker with, with black powder tube mags, and maybe some interesting stuff could have And happened. eventually you would have seen, I mean, there's no reason you couldn't have, they wouldn't have run forever, but you could have, you could have some automatic black powder guns. Yeah, not really. They'll work for a short duration of time. Yeah. They foul quickly. Yeah, everyone tried that. Yeah. It never really worked for anybody. Fair enough. Colin B. Do you feel that competitive shooting, IDPA, USBSA, 3-gun, etc., negatively affects or creates bad habits for law enforcement? No. I mean, anything can create a bad habit if you let it. There's no need, there's no reason that competition shooting should be a negative. Um, I think 
Yeah. Well, I see where he's going with this because yeah. there's a lot of there's there's emphasis and it's depending on the venue. There's emphasis on things where it's speed at all costs and things like, for example, about properly using cover or properly doing a tactical reload or any of those type of things can occur True. and do occur regularly. Um, the, 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 the thing that I always, my retort to this, and I hear this quite often, is that some venues are better than others for this sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So you should look at the venue you're going to shoot in. And it's not necessarily because it's IDPA or USBSA. So much depends on the actual match director. So your mm -hmm. local IDPA, your local IDPA could be fantastic, and an IDPA match director one range away might be garbage, right? It's, it's, it's so much dependent. Not the, the type of competition matters less than the person running it. That's one. Two, your mindset of how you approach it matters. Mm -hmm. If there's things that are absolutely against your grain, this is something I should not be doing, don't do it. You're, if, if your goal there is to garner skill sets, don't go there to win, go there to garner skill sets. Mm -hmm. And the score, therefore, is less relevant. And lastly, if you can't, I think, and this, I know this is going to be controversial because people will say muscle memory and all this stuff, but if you can't in your mind differentiate between shooting at paper and steel on a range, for accelerating and, and, and garnering better marksmanship and firearms handling skill sets, and that and tactical training and or actual combat, I think there's something wrong there a little bit. Yeah. So the two things that this brings to mind are first off, like someone who's totally out of shape, and they look at some pictures of like a professional bodybuilding competition, and they go, "Oh man, those dudes just look weird. I don't, I don't want to do that. I better not lift weights." Mm. It's like no. <laughs> It's, it's going to be so long before you're going to develop like bad habits of, of uh, cover use from shooting IPSC as compared to the vast amounts of skill you have available to build in just basic gun handling. Mm. I think a lot of law enforcement officers have very little shooting experience. Yes. Obviously, the ones we're around do because we're around them because we're around them at the matches. But most cops just don't do much shooting and they mm -hmm. just don't have the proficiency that you would really kind of want them to have. And there is so much of that that is there to be gained. Um, the, the other way to, I, the other thing this brings to mind kind of this along the same lines is like, oh my God, look at those NASCAR drivers. Mm -hmm. They're so focused on, you know, the right hand turn or left. I honestly mm -hmm. don't know which it is. Like, oh my God, can you imagine how dangerous they must be on the street? Well, the answer is no. Those guys are going to be like the best conceivable drivers even on the highway ever. <laughs> even though they only turn one direction in the actual competition. Right. Because they've got so much experience driving and using the vehicle and so much of it, their reaction times and their understanding of, of, of the mechanical systems that they're using has become so subconscious that they can focus on paying attention to what's actually happening and not be the guy, if we transition back to shooting, not be the guy who has to look down at his holster to figure out how to draw the gun when he's trying to... Uh, no. All the, there are so many skills you will build in competition long before you're, you're getting bad habits, unless you're like really not in tune with reality. The opportunity to do actual legitimate tactical training to the amount of volume of rounds down range and time spent on the range, presentation opportunities, all of those things that occur in a match environment, the opportunity to do that in a tactically sound environment class, etc., is extremely small compared to how many times you can go to a match, yeah. whatever that match is, and place yourself against others in a field of competition with psychological, physiological stress with a timer. Yeah. And all of those things will inc absolutely increase your skill set. And there is, I heard someone actually say this, I forgot who it was, it was a good one. Um, uh, what is a gunfight if it's not a two-way competition? <laughs> uh, fair enough. So, you know what? I'll tell you what. Some of these guys that shoot USPSA and do everything tactically unsound, Everything in their tech wear shirt with their stupid open race holster. Stupid, in air quotes, no offense. You put that up against someone that doesn't practice, they will freaking destroy them, <laughs> whether or not they use cover or not, because if there's a point in which their skill set so overcomes any of those deficiencies that yeah. it's irrelevant. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying they shouldn't. Right. They'd but, be even better if they did use proper tactical things. But So, yeah. I do not think it is negatively affects or creates bad habits as long as the person going into it goes into it with the right mindset does not intentionally do things incorrectly and uses that as a venue for skill improvement. Yeah. Yep. So we have so many questions. That was Ooh. the end of part one. Yes. So, and Doggo agrees. So part one is over. If you like this kind of Q&A, stay tuned because part two will be coming up on the station, the channel, probably as the next published video. Yeah. So part right. one, stay tuned for part two.